Okay, today we're going to be going over our regulation methods. And so this is the last of uh, the 10 le lectures that we're doing here in the regeneration treatment unit. Uh, next week we'll be moving on to our establishment treatment unit. And today we're really focused on the ecology and economics. We're not going to get much into the societal aspects here. And so with these regulation methods we're covering, they are intended to be applied to our uneven aged regeneration methods. So keep in mind the difference between a regulation method and a regeneration method. Um, if I ask you all questions about regulation methods on a quiz, generally you all do very poorly on that question. So we're going to go over three regulation methods today, which are how you make quantitative decisions on what trees are you going to cut down at each entry in an uneven age regeneration method. So you're regulating the cut. That's why we're calling them regulation methods. And so you saw these in the golden reading where he did a good job using longleaf pine as an example of these three regulation methods. But what we have is area regulation, volume regulation, and structural regulation. And I'm doing them in this order because that's kind of the order of increasing complexity. So I'll go over each of them briefly um, and then I'll have you all split up into groups uh, and work through a simple little problem related to these in your group. And so that's what we'll be doing for today. And so we're gonna start with area regulation. Uh, when I post the lecture slides, I'll be posting a spreadsheet as well with them. This spreadsheet's gonna have tabs for each of these different regulation methods. So you can get into the spreadsheet, you can play around with the different numbers in there and see how they work. So area regulation is gonna be the simplest of our three regulation methods. Um, and it's pretty easy to implement with a group or patch selection system, but much more difficult to implement with a single tree selection system. So uh, the last lecture where we actually covered the selection silvicultural systems, I showed you a few photos of gaps. We saw that gap in Doug fir, um, and then we looked at that gap in the sugar maple stand up in Wisconsin. And so if you're trying to quantify the area of the gap formed by cutting down one tree, that gets pretty difficult to do pretty quickly. Um, so, you know, it's hard to apply the system with single tree selection. There's an equation at the bottom there for uh, you know, the, the area regulation approach here. That equation, you can manipulate it a bunch of different ways algebraically. And with that equation, you all may not even need it. You all may be able to do this intuitively just in your head, just kind of using common sense. And so the equation's there if you need it, uh, but if you come up with a way where you can do this problem in your head and it makes sense and it works, you may not need that equation at all. The math is very, very simple on area regulation. I've already been using examples of area regulation throughout the class when I've been talking about rotation lengths and saying if you had a 100 acre stand and you cut 10 acres every 10 years, you know, that was an area regulation problem. So we've already been using these a little bit, okay? Um, so when you look at that equation, you could rewrite it as area harvested equals, and you could put stand area and cutting cycle both above rotation length. Okay, you can see how that's algebraically the same, which means you could multiply both sides of that equation by rotation length, which means you could get another equation that says rotation length times area harvested, equals stand area times cutting cycle. And you could move this all around. You could make half a dozen you know, forms of this same equation to solve problems for any one of those variables pretty easily. So the math on this is pretty basic algebra. So what I want you to do now, and you see you've got that same equation at the bottom for you if you need it, go ahead and split up into groups. And what we're gonna do is these two scenarios. So in scenario one, um, you have a 250 acre stand. You know you're going to be on a 75 year rotation. You know the logger needs to be able to cut 50 acres in this particular stand to make it so they'll bid on the job. So you've got to cut 50 acres at each entry. And because this is one of your selection systems, you know you want to open up cuttings that are about an acre in size. So you're creating openings that are an acre in size. That's going to fit the silvics of the species. I haven't even given you the species because this is all just geometry we're looking at here. So for that one, I want you to answer two things. One, what is the cutting cycle? And two, is it gonna be group or patch selection? So we're looking at those two things. Um, and then second, the second scenario there, um, you've got an area in the world where you know you're on about a 50 year rotation and you've got some investor um, and you know selection 
silviculture is going to work in this area. And the investor wants income every five years. That's how they want to manage their cash flow. You know, loggers in this area on many stand types want to bid on stuff that's 45 acres or more. So, you know, sort of give this investor advice on what's the minimum acreage they need to be looking at purchasing of forest land in order to make this hypothetical system. Okay, so go ahead and split up into groups and take a minute to work on that. Okay, sounds like most of you have some pretty good ideas on these. Uh, so let me jot up, you know, one way you could think about doing this. But if you got to the same answer a different way, you know, that, that's fine. There's lots of different ways you could think about these. So as I look at scenario one there, where I have my 250 acre stand, okay, so my stand's 250 acres, and I know my loggers need to cut 50 acres each time they go out there. So if I take my 250 and divide it by my 50 acres, that gives me five. And that tells me that there's, you know, five times each rotation that my logger needs to go out there to cut the whole thing, okay? So I know I'm making five entries per rotation. Then I know I'm on a 75 year rotation. Okay, I know I have to make five entries. And so what that tells me is I'm going out there every 15 years. That's my cutting cycle. Okay, so everyone see how we got to the cutting cycle? All of you get 15. Okay, so we've got a 15 year cutting cycle. So that's the first part of this. Um, let me go ahead and erase that. Next up, we've got to figure out if this is group or patch selection. And there's two common sense ways you would do that. Okay. I know my codominants are 90 feet tall. What's my break point between group and patch selection? Twice the height of the trees. Twice the height of the trees. Okay. So we could think about this as a square. Okay. Or we could think about this as a circle. Okay, those are the two most common sense ways to do it. So if I know this needs to be twice the dominant height of the canopy, that would mean I have a square that's 180 by 180 feet. Okay, if I'm doing a circle, I can put the radius in here at the height of my canopy, which is 90 feet, which means the diameter is twice the height of my canopy. Okay, so then I can simply use my equations where I'm trying to solve for area here. And in this case, I know for a square area, equals length times width is the generic formula for any rectangle. Of course, with a square, we could, we have length and width the same, so you could do it the side squared. So area equals one side squared. So here I've got area equals 180 squared, and that's going to equal 32,400 square feet. This should be a 400. There we go. Okay. Then if I do the area of a circle over here, I know area equals pi r squared, 90 squared is 8,100, 8,100 times pi, and I know here that my area equals 25,446 feet squared. Okay, so that's the area you would get if you cut these openings that were square, if they were a circle, as the breakpoint between group or patch selection. Well, how many square feet do I have per acre? 43,560. So these are the size of the openings that I'm actually making because I'm cutting one acre openings, okay? So are my openings smaller than or larger than an acre? They're smaller than no matter which way you figure them out, okay? So is this group or patch selection? They're smaller than twice the height, so this is gonna be group selection. Or sorry, they're larger than twice the height. Yeah, you said it right, Well, They're larger than twice the height. This is what I have. This Below this would be group, above it is patch, so th this is patch selection. So we have patch selection here. You can see, depending on you know, the, the geometry of your openings, there could be some wiggle room in between. Um, so if I give you a problem on these, I'll make it so whichever way you do it, you know, it comes out with a clear answer. But in terms of what this wiggle room is, you know, we don't have a species up here. You would need to know the silvics of your species and you would use that to decide what the nature of your openings was. But generally here in the South, we're probably not calling it patch selection you know, until you get over an acre in size and start getting it larger there. So, okay, so that told us, you know, that we're doing patch selection, we're on a 15 year cutting cycle. So you can see all the math is pretty straightforward stuff here that you all have already had in hopefully K through 12. Let's look at that other problem there. And I can kind of go ahead and do this one the same way. I know I'm on a 50 year rotation. 
I know the investor wants income every five years. And so I can go with my 50 year rotation. I know my cutting cycle is every five years, which means I need to go and enter the stand 10 times. So I've got 10 entries in a rotation, right? And I now know that at each entry, I have to cut 45 acres per one entry. And I multiply that by 10 entries. And that tells me that my landowner needs to acquire 450 acres. So that would be the minimum that they need to acquire under those assumptions. All right, uh, so next up, let's move on to volume regulation. Okay, and this is gonna be a, a little complex to explain, especially compared to area regulation. This is going to be a little bit counterintuitive, okay? Um, and so with volume regulation, it's gonna tie in really well to timber cruising. So you all are, you know, many of you are working on timber cruising right now. And so you need a good cruise in order to make this work out. Okay, this doesn't work without a really good standard stock table that you've put together. Um, you need more than one cruise. You need periodic cruises because if you're applying these selection systems, Usually you're gonna go out and cruise the stand before each entry. So you're cruising it about as often as the cutting cycle there, okay? Um, and so because you have those repeated inventories on this forest over time, you'll be able to figure out how fast your stand is growing. So we'll use board feet on this exercise because many of these selection systems, you're growing them for high quality saw timber. And so often we tend to think in board feet. And so if you know your stand is growing 100 board foot per acre per year, then you would know over five years you grow 500 board feet per acre, okay? If you cut more than that, is it gonna be sustainable long-term? No, if you cut more than growth, that's by definition not sustainable over the long-term. If you keep doing that, you're gonna have less and less and less out there, assuming growth remains constant. And so what you wanna do is figure out what that allowable cut is. If you cut about that at each entry, it should in theory be sustainable. So, you know, you're going to see this applied a lot to group selection, maybe to patch selection. You can absolutely apply this to single tree selection, but you really need a forester doing this with a careful eye on avoiding high grade. So you really want to have the focus on improving your stand as you do this. Okay, so I think it was you all that had the, the quiz question on diameter limit cutting um, on that quiz on Tuesday. And so remember, the definition of diameter limit cutting is cutting all the trees above or below a certain diameter. So around our part of the world, where most of our trees that we want to manage in our overstory are on the intolerant end of the shade tolerance spectrum, what you really need to do if you, if you start looking at, you know, what the practice is, if you cut everything above 12 inches, say, think about what that's going to leave out in the forest. So if you go cut everything 12 inches and over, What's your stand gonna look like afterwards? If it's a mature stand, a pine stand, a mixed pine hardwood stand, a hardwood stand around here, what's that stand look like afterwards? It's gonna look pretty rough, okay? The trees that we've got that are smaller are generally gonna be species that can't make it into the overstory like hornbeam, hop hornbeam, dogwood, mulberry, or they're gonna be trees in suppressed crown positions, smaller pines, smaller hardwoods, that have been growing in low light, they probably have poor stem form, they've been suppressed for a long time, they may not respond to that release. So if you just go cut all the trees bigger than a set diameter limit around here, it almost always leads to high grade, okay? I got a call a few years ago from some landowners and they said to me, well, a logger came and timbered our stand, so already you're thinking, uh-oh. Um, and they said, well, he cut all the pines bigger than 13 inches. What do we do now? And, you know, I sent them a list of consulting foresters they could work with because they probably have a high graded stand and they probably have some difficult decisions to make now because it probably has not been managed well. They may have made a lot of money on that one operation, but, you know, they have not set themselves up for success in the future. Um, so I want to make it clear that this is not just a diameter limit. This is a volume guiding diameter limit approach. And so it differs from that diameter limit cutting in two key ways. One, this diameter limit is flexible. You can leave trees bigger than your diameter limit and you can cut trees smaller than your diameter limit. It is flexible. And two, 
This is a tool that is intended to be used by foresters, okay? You're not gonna turn a, a logger loose with something like this. This is gonna be the forester using this as a tool to help them mark the stand so then the logger can harvest that stand based on the markings. And that's how you're gonna avoid high grading with this approach, okay? So you figure out what the maximum stocking for your stand is, how many board feet you can hold on that stand. You figure out how fast your saw timber sized trees are growing. You set a cutting cycle from that. So it's gonna be sustainable, but so that you're removing enough at each entry that the logger is willing to come out and do the harvest. And so you set this theoretical guiding diameter limit so that if you cut all the trees that size and bigger, that removes the volume that you need to remove at that entry, okay? Um, but you don't just hold fast to that. You can remove smaller trees, you can leave bigger trees to meet your objectives and leave the stand growing well for the future. So it is just a guide, it's not a hard and fast rule. And so you also, as you're doing this, need to think about thinning the areas that you don't cut, okay? Uh, so, you know, the areas that you're not regenerating, you can thin them. So that can be where you remove some of those smaller trees from. Um, and if your stand's understocked, you cut less. If your stand's overstocked, you may cut more. All of this is flexible depending on your specific scenario. Um, so uh, let me see if I can bring this up. So this is the spreadsheet um, that I'll have posted along with the lecture notes you'll be able to look through. But I wanna use it as an example of what we're gonna be doing here with our volume diameter guiding limit here. So we have two inch size classes. So there's our DBH columns. You guys all are familiar with that. We've gone out and we've put in fixed area plots or we've done points and we've tallied up all our trees, all our plots or all our points. We've calculated trees per acre in each size class. You all know how to do that. Uh, we've calculated basal area in each size class. So you've covered all this in biometrics and in timber cruising. Then you need one column that you may not have had on you know, your standard stock tables that you've used before. And again, we're using units of board feet, but you need a single entry volume table. So you need to calibrate this to your specific stand. So you need to have figured out a pretty good sense to work this system of how many board feet you're gonna have in trees of different diameter classes. So in this example on that top row, we know the average 10 inch tree is gonna yield 39 board feet. Um, and then if you look down a few rows at the 20 inch row there, we know the average 20 inch tree is gonna yield 314 board feet. So you need to have a sense of what your recovery is gonna be from trees of different diameter classes. Um, and so if you've been working on this stand for a number of years, you've already done some harvests, that can help you figure this out. But the other thing you can do is you can use existing volume tables. And when you look at these existing volume tables, when you cruise the stand, you'll be estimating merchantable height and you'll be estimating diameters. And from that, what you'll be able to do is you'll be able to create a list of all your 10 inch trees. And they may be one log high, one and a half log high, two log high, but you'll know what the average volume in each one is looking it up on a volume table. So that's how you would do that. Okay, then we have a board foot per acre column, and all that is is we've taken our trees per acre and multiplied it by the board feet in each of them. So you can see how you would calculate that column. And then finally, you need the column to the far right, where all you're doing is you're adding up the board feet in that size class to the board feet in every other larger size class. So it's cumulative board feet in larger classes. So here's how you would use this to mark a stand using the volume guiding diameter limit approach. Okay, so let's say that in this particular hypothetical example, what I wanna do is I wanna remove 5,000 board feet per acre. So I've done all the math, I've figured out my allowable cut, my cutting cycle, and from all that I figure out, hey, I need to remove 5,000 board feet in this entry. And so what you would do is you would look over here so you can see on there uh, that uh, in that 24 inch size class, that green highlighted cell, uh, we have 556 board feet in there. So I cut all my 24 inch trees, I get 556 board feet. Um, and then I cut all my 22 inch trees. That gives me this 1374 plus 556. So that's 1900 board feet. I'm still not at my 5,000 yet. So then I cut all my 20 inch trees. So now it's 1570 plus 1374 plus 556, that's giving me 3,500 board feet right here. 
and that's still not the 5,000 that I need. And so then I come here and I cut all the 18, 20, 22, and 24 inch trees. I add all those numbers up and it's pretty darn close to the 5,000 that I'm targeting. That's gonna be close enough. So I say that my volume guiding diameter limit is 18 inches, okay? Now that you know that, that's just theoretical. If I cut all the 18 inch trees and larger, I've got my volume. I'm, I'm marking it exactly how I need. So here's how the forester then applies that in the woods with the can of paint in their hand. You use this as kind of a running tally with the plus minus where you're trying to stay around zero. So what you do is you go out there and you're marking all the 18, 20, 22, 24 inch trees, except when you come to a good one. So let's say I come to a really nice 18 inch tree and that tree is gonna get better and better over the next five, 10, 15 years. So I wanna continue growing that tree and I wanna cut it later when it's an even better tree. Well, I leave it. I do not mark it, we're not gonna cut it. But what I know from this table as I'm doing this is, hey, now I'm under harvesting by 250 board feet because I know the size of the, the volume of that 18 inch tree. Okay, so I just keep a running tally, okay. I've undercut by 250 board feet. Well, then you keep going through the stand and remember in this theoretical system, you're not cutting these smaller trees, right? So you're not marking them to cut. But let's say I come to an area that I, I wanna thin and it's got some 12 inch trees that are an undesirable species. I don't want them in my stand. Um, let's say there's four of them. Well, I go ahead and I mark those 12 inch trees, even though they're below my diameter limit and I'm gonna cut them from my stand. Well, if I look there, I marked four of them. That's gonna be about 236 board feet I just marked in that 12 inch class, that comes pretty close to making up for the 250 that I was undercutting by, by leaving this one 18 inch tree. And so now I'm back pretty close to zero. I'm good, I keep going. And so as the forester, you're marking trees to cut in all size classes. You're marking trees to leave in all size classes. You're just using this concept to make it easy to do the math in your head as you keep moving or with a little tally sheet as you keep moving through the stand. So by the time you get to the end of that stand, you'll have a tally of, okay, here's everything I marked. You'll be able to use that to put it out to bid for the loggers. And you'll be able to look at it and say, I've got a hundred acre stand here. And sure enough, I marked out 500,000 board feet to cut. So I've met my target, you know? So any questions on how you apply this and what it is? I know that's kind of complex to just sit there and try and soak in, so. Let's do this instead. There's a stand and stock table for you. Very similar to the one that I just showed you and talked about. The only difference is I have not included that far right column where it added up all the board feet in every larger size class. So I haven't given you any equations for this, but if you understand the concept, this is just basic addition, subtraction. That's all you're really using out here. A little bit of multiplication and division. So I've got three questions for you. What cutting cycle are you gonna put this stand on, okay? And when you calculate that cutting cycle, let's assume this landowner wants to make frequent financial returns. They wanna harvest as often as they can so they get that cash flow coming in. The second question is how many board feet can you remove at each entry? And then once you've done those two things, answer these right in order, what's the diameter limit? So what's your diameter limit gonna be on this stand that you're gonna use in this volume guiding diameter limit approach? So take a few minutes, work in your groups and see if you can come up with answers to those three. Okay, so it sounds like most of you've come up with the, the right ideas on here. Uh, so let me work a little bit of this out on the board for you and then we'll look at the table on the screen again. Um, so I know my stand is growing 700 board foot per year. Okay, and I know the logger needs 3000 board foot to harvest the stand. So all I do is 3,000 divided by 700, and that equals 4.2. But you can't harvest a stand every 4.2 years for a few reasons. Operationally, a logger is going to put, you know, you're gonna have like a 12 month harvest contract on there. So that means it's gonna be anyway between maybe 4.0 and 5.0 years. You're not gonna get it right at 4.2. And then if you're in a stand where your species, you know, are seasonal, like pretty much everything in our temperate region, you know, is that 0.2 years in the winter when the trees aren't really growing? Is that 0.2 years in the growing season? It just gets real messy. So the simple thing is that 3000 is a minimum. That's the minimum the logger will come out there for, okay? So just round it up. So we'll round that up to every five years, okay? And so now the minimum that a logger would come out for was 3000. 
the maximum we can cut now is defined by the ecosystem. The ecosystem is growing 700 more foot a year. It's doing that over five years. So we know now we can cut 3,500 board feet. Okay, so that's the answer to the first two questions. So if you're harvesting somewhere between 3,000 and 3,500 board feet at each entry, it's gonna be sustainable and the loggers are gonna be willing to bid on the job. If you go towards the lower end of this, over time your stand might start getting overstocked. You might start having too many trees out there. You might need to harvest a little bit more. If you go at the upper end and you get, you know, an outbreak of some sort of mortality, some sort of disturbance hits your stand, you might be over harvesting. So this is all very theoretical right now, but in the real world, you're gonna have to make adjustments around this as you go throughout the rotation. So let's look back at our table now that we've worked that out. And as we look at our table, let's start sort of seeing how we're gonna to get to that with our diameter limit. So as I look over here, if I cut all my 15 inch diameter trees, we can see that on that far right column volume, I'm cutting 1,404 uh, board feet. And so that's not gonna cut it. I need to be over 3,000 and less than 3,500. So let's move to the 14 inch trees. So if I cut those, I'm cutting another 1,512 board feet plus the 1,404 in the 15 inch size class. So I'm right over 2,900 board feet. Logger still isn't going to be, you know, really enthusiastic about bidding on that job. It's below what makes economic sense for them. So that means I'm going to have to go into the 13 inch class and I'm going to go in there and I'm going to pick up the remaining 600 board feet per acre I need to get me to my 3,500 board feet per acre. Okay. So I need to harvest about 600 board feet in the 13 inch class. So that means my diameter limit is 13. So if I harvest 600 divided by 1,500, I'm harvesting about 40% of the trees in that 13 inch class, all the 14 inch trees and all the 15 inch trees. So that's how my diameter limit is working. So again, very simple stand. We only have five size classes out here, but you can see how it would work from a market standpoint. So now as I go through this stand and I'm marking it, I'm just thinking in my head, you know, I'm kind of going close to cutting every other 13 inch tree, but I'm marking a little less than that because I want 40%, not, um, you know, 50%. So really I'm marking three out of every five, or I'm, I'm keeping three out of every five 13 inch trees I see. I'm marking all the 14s and all the 15s. But of course, this is just a flexible limit. So I go out there, I see a great 15 inch tree I wanna keep. I know it's 108 board feet. I keep it, that's fine. My running tally now tells me I'm 105 board feet under on my cut. And then I go out there, I find a couple 12 inch trees. I don't want them in my stand. I mark them to cut. Well, they're 48 inch, you know, 48 board feet each. So that brings me pretty close back to right on my prescription. So now I'm undercutting just by you know, 10 or 20 board feet per acre. Or I go out there and I leave another 15 inch tree and then I find three 11 inch trees I wanna remove. That's about equal, okay? So you use this as a forester just to give you this running guide on what you're actually gonna be harvesting, okay? So any questions on the volume guiding diameter limit? Yeah, Will. You, you can do whatever you need to do that's gonna meet the ecology of the stand, work with the silvics of your species and meet that landowner objective. Um, but to get to that question a little bit more in terms of what you harvest in each size class, that might get us a little bit more into our next topic, our final method of regulation. And this is gonna be structural regulation, okay? And so that'll sort of show you why you may, you know, you may not want to skip a size class like that. Uh, it depends on what you're trying to do. Structural regulation is pretty easy to explain, but the math on it is going to be pretty complex. Okay. And so what you see here is two curves. You see the dotted line at the top and the solid line at the bottom, and you see the shaded area in between. This is a diameter distribution. So what I have is DBH in inches on my x-axis and I have my trees per acre on my y-axis. So that dotted line on top is the stand that I have. The solid line below it is the stand that I want. So the shaded area in between is the trees that I cut. So if you know the stand you have, you know the stand you want and you can cut to get there, what you can do from this is generate a cut list. So I wanna cut so many 10 inch trees, 12 inch trees, 14 inch trees per acre, you know what you want to cut. As you go through and marking the stand, you're tallying them up. And by the time you're done marking that stand at the end, you'll know how many trees of each size class you marked. 
you'll be able to go back, check, and say, yeah, I got pretty close to my prescription here on this stamp, okay? So you can see how you could develop a very easy marking guide from this. You know you have to cut, you know, two 16-inch trees per acre. So that's easy to go mark. Okay, this is sort of what you're trying to do. We've talked about this. I've showed you these before. On the bottom is what you have. That's the irregular uneven age stamp, okay? On the top is what you want. That's the balanced all age stamp. And you want that stand on top because you cut the biggest trees and then the trees just smaller than them move to the right. They grow into that size class but they don't leave a void because there's more trees just to the left of them that move right and everything just keeps growing up. And so each time you go in there at the cutting cycle, you can cut the big saw timber and it just keeps on moving to the right, trees growing into the larger size classes and it's sustainable indefinitely. But again, we've talked about this, that reverse J-shaped curve, that's a goal, that's a theory. It's not something we commonly achieve. So what you're doing in structural regulation is you have some irregular diameter distribution at the bottom and you're doing what you can at each entry to get closer to a balanced all edge stamp. You may never get there, but you keep trying to get closer and closer and closer, okay? So any questions on what we're trying to do in this conceptually? So conceptually, I think we're all on the same page. I think it's pretty straightforward. Here's where it starts getting complicated. We need a way to implement these prescriptions. And so I'm gonna introduce a new uh, variable here that we haven't discussed before that's Q. And we're gonna use this as part of a BBQ prescription. And I'll define B and D for you in a minute here. And B and D are gonna be easy, it's stuff you already know. But Q is a new concept. And so that equation, you know, people are probably starting to worry because now I have subscripted variables and some of them are I plus one in the subscript. So it starts looking kind of complex there. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to go to the board here um, and I'm gonna sort of work through what Q is for you. And so let me put up a diameter distribution and show you how the math works on this. So again, our equation for Q was N sub I over N sub I plus one. But here's what it's actually doing. It's really straightforward. I've got this diameter distribution here. I've got dBH on my X axis and the unit on that is inches. Okay, and then I've got density on my y-axis, and the units on that is trees per acre. Okay, um, so as I look at this, I could draw out a diameter distribution as a straight line like we just saw in that last graph. Um, I could draw it out as a bar graph. I'm going to just draw it out as a simple little line graph here where each line represents a size class. And so I'm kind of, you know, doing my best to draw that reverse J shape. You can see I kind of got it. Well, let's look at this data. And so if we look at this stand, we may know, hey, I've got 22.5 trees in this size class. I've got 15 trees per acre in that size class. I've got 10 trees per acre in this size class. Okay, those numbers are N. Okay, so these subscripts are just which size class you're in. So Q would equal the number in a size class, so I'm gonna pick 22.5 divided by the number in the next largest size class, 15. Okay, so that's one way I can do it. I could apply it over here. So Q could equal 15 divided by the number in the next largest size class, 10. Okay, so you guys can probably do this one in your head. What's 15 divided by 10? 1.5, Q is 1.5. And I set this up, this is a balanced all age stand. So if we take 22.5 and divide it by 15, it's also equal to 1.5. If you have a balanced all age stand, Q will be the same regardless of which size classes you look at, okay? A balanced all age stand, that reverse J shape is by definition defined by one of these Q factors. So again, this equation, you know, makes you look a little nervous. It's very simple in practice. Here's the most common mistake I'll see on it. You'll look at it and you'll try to calculate Q. And what you'll do is you'll say, okay, I'm taking my 10 tree per acre size class and I'm dividing it by 15. And that gives you 0.67, two thirds. Okay, that's the most common mistake I see. But there's one simple thing you need to know that can help you avoid making that mistake. 
And it's simply that our variable Q is going to be greater than one and less than two. It's gonna range between one and two. So Q could be, Q should be one point something. So if you get a number less than one, just you know, make sure a warning bell goes off in your head. Oh, I flipped it, I did it wrong, okay? So Q should be one point something. So any questions on what Q is, how you calculate Q? It's just a ratio, that's all it is. Okay, so let's now look at why Q is important. And so as we look at this, that's how you calculate Q. Here's why you would wanna calculate different Qs. Okay, so what I have for you here is another diameter distribution. And so what we see in this diameter distribution is three different balanced all age stands, each characterized by a different Q factor. And so my dashed line there at top on the left is a Q factor of 1.7. My solid line in the middle is a Q factor of 1.5. And my dotted line at the bottom is a Q factor of 1.3. And so for those small trees, for the two inch, the four inch, the six inch trees, we see very obvious differences, right? And so if I have a bigger Q factor, do I have more small trees or less small trees? The bigger the Q factor, the more small trees you have. The smaller the Q factor, the less small trees you have. So you can try to pick a Q factor for a stand. I could take a stand and I could say, I wanna cut this to a Q factor of 1.7. And that may work in that stand, it may not. If you have a stand where the species tend to be more intolerant of shade, it's gonna be harder for you to have more small trees out there because they're gonna get suppressed by those older, larger trees, right? And so you may not be able to achieve that. So the silvix of the trees in your stand will dictate what you can select as a Q factor to some extent. You'll have a, some wiggle room within a stand where you can select a Q factor. Okay, so bigger Q factors, more small trees. Look at the large trees. Look at the 18 and 20 inch size classes there. Is there a difference? Not very much. It does not look like there's a difference, but we need to think about this very carefully. What you'll notice is that the 1.3 line is slightly higher than the 1.5 line, which is slightly higher than the 1.7 line. It may only be by one or two. Look at our axis, that's between zero and 20 trees per acre. So we may only be talking about a difference of one or two 20 inch DBH trees per acre. Is that a big difference? That is a big difference, okay? Think about it, you're a landowner with a 100 acre stand. Would you want an extra 20 inch tree per acre? Yeah. When they harvest your 100 acre stand, if you have an extra 20 inch trees per acre, you have 100 more 20 inch trees on that stand. And those 20 inch trees, maybe two, two and a half, three log trees. Uh, think about the logs you would cut off them if they're high quality going down the road on a log truck. That is a lot of wood. So that does not look like a big difference, but it's a big difference from a timber standpoint. It's a big difference from an ecological standpoint. A 20 inch tree might have a crown that's a 10th of an acre, right? So it's occupying a lot of area in that stand. So that doesn't look like much of a difference on this graphic, but it really is a pretty significant difference in your stand. So to sum all that up, the larger Q factors means more little trees, less big trees. The smaller Q factor means fewer little trees, but more big trees. So you're just deciding what the balance of the size of trees is in your stand, okay? So that's Q and that's why you would pick a certain Q. So let's tie it together into everything you need to make a structural regulation prescription. Okay, BDQ. And you guys know B and D. B is a target basal area after your harvest. The most common mistake I see on that is people think it's the basal area now. No, that's your post-harvest basal area, okay? And then D is the largest tree you have post-harvest, okay? So if your mills in your area will only take up to a 24 inch tree, you may want the largest tree in your stand to be 24, 22 inches so that you're keeping everything that you harvest as merchantable. Um, if you have a species where you know they tend to become over mature, you know, when they get to 30 inches DBH and they start getting heart rot or issues like that, or sprouting is reduced, we'll talk about that next class. There's lots of reasons you could use to, you know, factor into your decision on what the largest diameter tree you want to keep out there is, okay? So that top one, the, the basal area after a harvest, have you all been doing anything this week where you've used that concept? Yeah, 
Right, so you guys have been doing the Pitaita lab and you've been doing low thin and using a basal area target. So you guys have already been using that just for a thin, not for a regeneration treatment, but you're already familiar with that, you're already using that, okay? So this BDQ method has been tried out with Crosset Experimental Forest in Arkansas and they've gotten it to work for lava oil and shortleaf pine. Um, so it, it can work here in the South, okay? Okay, here's where it gets complex. So conceptually, not a big deal. I don't think we have any problems with it conceptually. Here's how you implement it mathematically. It gets a little messy. <laughs> so, you know, a number of people already running to the bathroom as soon as you see that sigma sign, right? You know, start getting worried about that equation. And so what I've done, you, you don't have to work out that equation. You don't have to worry about it for this class. It's more complex than what we're really getting into for this class. Uh, but again, what I've done is we've got this spreadsheet that'll be posted to the course website. And if you look at this spreadsheet, I'm gonna see if I can get us over to a BDQ tab. So I've got a few BDQ tabs on it. So this is a BDQ tab. Um, and if I look at that one, I'm gonna see if I can click some stuff without breaking it. Okay, I've got this in two inch diameter size classes. And so four inch, six inch, eight inch trees. This is a purely hypothetical stand. I made up this data, but you can see what I've done is I've made up a stand that's already a balanced all age stand. It's already parameterized by a Q factor. And so what this spreadsheet allows you to do is put in the basal area you want after a harvest, put in the largest diameter tree you want after a harvest, put in the Q factor. So let's go with that 1.7. Let's manage for more little trees and less big trees. See what that looks like. Um, and then I go over here and I look at the graph. And what the graph is showing me, the tops of the bars, so the very top of the bars is the stand we have pre-harvest. And where the color changes here in the middle between the orange and the green, that's that green bar is the stand you're gonna have post-harvest, okay? And so this orange area in between the top and the green bar right here, that's your cut list. So that's the trees you wanna cut in each size class to implement that prescription. So again, this is hypothetical data. So you see in this example, it's working out very, very well, right? I'm able to cut trees in every size class to move from where I am to where I wanna be. But of course, you know, that's not how this is probably gonna work in the real world. Okay, 26 works. But as I look over at this now, um, it, it didn't do it. But sometimes what you'll see is you'll end up with a negative bar. You'll have a negative orange bar sticking out below the X axis. So it's telling you in a certain size class, go in there and cut negative three trees. How do you cut negative three trees? You're not going to realistically plant them because you can't plant a 20 inch tree. Um, you can do that in urban forestry if you have a lot of money and you know that tree may still die, but yeah, so you can't get them there. You can't cut them. That's telling you that you can get closer to what you want in the next cutting cycle. You're not going to get there. Keep working at it and maybe eventually you'll get there. Because again, keep in mind what you're doing with all of this. Let me go back to the PowerPoint. What you're doing with all of this is you're trying to move from that irregular stand on the bottom towards the top. So you're gonna have size classes like we see there where we're missing trees and you're gonna have your math telling you, hey, you need to cut trees in the size class, but they're not there. And so you just keep getting closer and closer and closer. What it kind of looks like is you're lopping the tops off those high peaks in that irregular distribution. Um, and then, you know, you're hoping over time you get recruitment into those size classes you're missing. So, so any questions on how structural regulation works. Okay, so we've got uh, about 15 minutes left in class, not quite. And so I wanna spend the, the rest of class working on this, okay? Um, and what you're gonna do, the first part of it's simple. I have a very simple stand for you. This stand only has three size classes, at 10 inch, 11 inch, and 12 inch trees. And so the first thing I want you to do is look at that stand and figure out if it is characterized by a Q factor. Some of you can probably look at it and do that math in your head right now. That's gonna be an easy question. And what does that tell you about the age class structure of this stand, okay? So that's the easy part. The next part is I want you to take this stand as it is and implement that BDQ prescription where you're gonna cut it down to 80 square feet per acre. You want the maximum diameter tree post harvest at 11 inches and you want it characterized by a Q factor of 1.25, okay? Um, and so, you know, what I'll do is I'll go ahead and put a table up here on the board for you, and I'll give you all bonus points for the first uh, group that's able to fill in this table. But what we're gonna have, it's gonna look just like this, where we have BBH, basal area, sorry, I've got tree breaker, then basal area, tree breaker, 
then basal area. I've got my 10, 11, and 12 inch trees, and then my total column. Okay, so I've got that. Make this in the nice neat boxes. Okay, and as we start to implement this prescription, what's our target basal area? 80. So we already know what that box is going to be on this table. Okay. And then we know the biggest tree we want out in the stand post harvest is going to be 11 inches. So what does this 12 inch row look like? You're going to cut them. Those are zeros. Okay. So really what you're doing is you're filling in these remaining five boxes. You want the tree spraker in this box to be 1.25 times the number of tree spraker in this box. Okay. And then you can't just make up so many trees per acre at a certain diameter and make up a different basal area. That's, that's not how it works. Each tree has a certain cross-sectional area. And if you have so many of those, you have a certain basal area. And so that equation on the bottom left is how you calculate basal area from trees per acre and the diameter class there. Okay. So what you're doing is you're trying to come up with tree per acre numbers that seem to work and give you the right prescription from a Q factor standpoint, calculate the basal areas and see if they get you close to 80. Okay. Any questions on this exercise? All right, go ahead and take a crack at it and I'll award bonus points to whichever team is able to put a correct answer up there. So. All right. So we had a group get a correct answer here. Um, so you can see what we did. Again, you know, in this BBQ prescription, the largest trees you were leaving was 11 inches. So we knew you're cutting all the 12 inch trees. So you go ahead and you zero those out. And then you know that this box needs to be 1.25 times this box. And so in this particular case, we actually started with 60 trees in this size class. So the, the solution here was actually, you're not cutting any trees in this class, but because this stand had already been parameterized with a Q factor of 1.5, we had originally had 90 trees in this size class. So by cutting 15 of them, it drops your basal area here from 49 down to, you know, just over 40. This basal area stays the same at about 39.6 rounds up to 40. And that gives you a stand with pretty close to 80 square feet per acre. You may not be able to get it exactly without cutting like a decimal number of trees here, but this is pretty darn close to what the prescription is. Okay. So any questions on how you actually apply and implement a BDQ prescription? So you can see this was a very, very, very simple example, a stand with just three size classes. Um, and even then you're using some trial and error to try and figure it out. But if you ever want to apply this in the real world, again, I'll have that spreadsheet uploaded for you. Um, and you can you know, go start looking at that and tinkering with that, uh, with that more complex equation. So computationally, it's difficult to implement. Theoretically, it's simple. And if you have a very simple stand, you can kind of figure it out by applying these concepts. So, so remember, you know, we've gone over three regulation methods. And so this is showing you how to develop a cut list for your stand so you know how to go out and market for harvest. And we're applying these to our uneven aged regeneration methods. So keep that in mind, regulation method, regeneration method, not the same thing.